This chapter is all about the main group elements, which are the 50 elements that occupy groups 1a through 8a of the periodic table, also known as groups 1, 2, and then 13 through 18. These are the S block and the P block elements, with the S block being groups 1 and 2, and the P block being groups 13 through 18. The main group elements are naturally abundant and super important in both commercial products and the human body. So among elements in the Earth's crust, main group elements that we find a lot of include oxygen, silicon, aluminum, magnesium, and calcium, and really only one transition metal is common in the Earth's crust, and that's iron. In the human body, the importance of the main group elements is even stronger, where we have hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen as the four big players, as well as other players such as calcium, phosphorus, and sulfur. These are all main group elements, and really the concentrations of transition metals in the human body are much, much lower than the concentrations of main group elements. So they're hugely important. There are five properties of the main group atoms that are mainly responsible for the behavior of these elements. And you should be familiar with these terms from previous discussions. So we have atomic radius, ionization energy, as well as the related concept of electron affinity, electronegativity, and polarizability. These five properties of the main group elements explain a lot of their chemical behavior. Let's review how these key properties vary across the periodic table, starting with properties across a period. So as we move from left to right across a period, ionization energy increases, electronegativity increases, and atomic radius decreases. As we move down the periodic table, down a group, we see the opposite trends. So moving downward, ionization energy and electronegativity both decrease, while atomic radius increases, and this is due to the addition of larger shells, larger principal quantum number for the valence electrons as we move down the group. Metallic character tends to increase as we move down the periodic table. So there's sort of a stair-step progression in the metals that goes on, where elements to the left of this green stair-step line I'm drawing are metals, while elements to the right are non-metals. And so we can see that, in general, there's essentially no metallic character in the first row of the periodic table. We get more metallic elements as we move further down. And indeed, metallic character appears to decrease as we move to the right as well. We have more metallic elements on the left-hand side of the periodic table, less metallic elements on the right-hand side. And this trend sort of goes hand-in-hand hand with the electronegativity trend. As electronegativity increases, metallic character decreases. One other thing that's worth mentioning, and a key idea that we're going to come back to at the end of this video, is that the effective nuclear charge on the valence electrons increases as we move to the right. And the increase in Z effective, as we call it, plays a big role in explaining, on a more fundamental level, why ionization energy electronegativity increase and atomic radius decreases. Recall that polarizability is the ability of a molecule's cloud of electrons to be distorted by a nearby electric field. In other words, a molecule or an atom that doesn't distort hardly at all in the presence of an electric field, say we introduced a positive charge on one side of this atom and a negative charge on the other, and there was very little to no distortion of the electron cloud, we would call this not very polarizable. You can think of the electron cloud as relatively rigid, like a rock. It doesn't deform in the presence of an electric field. Bigger molecules often have the ability to deform their electron clouds without a significant energetic penalty. So something like this, we can imagine in the presence of the same type of electric field could deform its electron cloud so that more electrons are near the positive end than the negative end, and we would think of this type of molecule as polarizable. The punchline here is that larger atoms and molecules, larger species, are associated with greater polarizability. This has implications, for example, in intermolecular forces where greater polarizability translates into stronger London forces, since a polarized molecule is associated with a significant instantaneous dipole. All five of these key atomic properties can be related back to the concept of effective nuclear charge, or Z-effective, which is a concept we've seen before. We can think of the atom as containing a core nucleus of positive charge, a set of core electrons that are relatively close to the nucleus, 
and then an outer set of valence electrons which are farther away from the nucleus. The valence electrons feel the positive charge of the nucleus, but in fact, they don't feel all of the positive charge of the nucleus. So if we, talk, if we call the total amount of positive charge Z, that's just equal to the atomic number, right? The effective nuclear charge felt by the valence electrons is less than Z. In other words, the total number of positive charges in the nucleus is greater than the effective nuclear charge. This happens because the core electrons shield the positive charge of the nucleus. You can think of it like they absorb or soak up some of the positive charge so that the valence electrons, which are relatively far away, feel less of the positive charge from the nucleus than the core electrons. As we move from left to right across a period, we're increasing the number of protons in the nucleus. However, we're not increasing the number of core electrons since the core shells are completely filled. Because those core electrons don't improve their ability to shield the valence electrons from the nuclear charge as we move left to right across a period, this means that the effective nuclear charge felt by those valence electrons increases as we move from left to right. We're adding protons, we're adding charge to the nucleus without adding any core electrons to improve the shielding ability of the core to block positive charge from being felt by the nucleus. Another way to think about this is that the effective nuclear charge approaches the actual nuclear charge. So the actual nuclear charge is still greater than Z effective, but Z effective inches closer to Z as we move across a period. The implications of effective nuclear charge are far and wide. For example, we can imagine that if the valence electrons feel a stronger effective nuclear charge, they're going to get pulled in toward the nucleus. They're attracted to the nucleus. This is the origin of the smaller atomic radii of elements on the right-hand side of the main group as opposed to the left-hand side. The larger Z effective pulls in those valence electrons. Ionization energy is governed by a similar idea. The larger effective positive nuclear charge means that more energy is required to pull electrons out of an atom on the right-hand side of the main group as opposed to one on the left-hand side. 